crowd. Uh, Douglas is obviously very popular and I think <coughs> by the end of the night we'll understand yeah, why. <laughs> this is our second book talk of 2014 <coughs> and uh, I am especially pleased to welcome our speaker and moderator this evening. Um, I'm especially pleased to welcome Douglas this evening. Douglas uh, really needs no welcome because he's a regular visitor to the library. He's actually a great supporter of the <coughs> library as well. Uh, but I, I do want to especially welcome him tonight because uh, he is here in his capacity as the Dean of Arts. And in my, if my memory serves me correctly, I believe he's the first Hong Kong U Dean to give a book talk since, <laughs> since its inception 12 and a little bit years ago. Shame That's a long that. time. So. We have set the precedent. Thank you, Douglas. Um, Douglas and I work together on the Hong Kong U Press Committee, which is a very active committee. We meet quite regularly, almost monthly. So I'm especially pleased to hear him with a different hat this evening. Uh, I'm not going to introduce him any further, but I'll leave that to our moderator, uh, Dr. Evelyn Chan. I, I will introduce uh, Dr. Chan. Uh, she is Assistant Professor from the Department of English at the Chinese University of Hong Kong. Uh, she is also the Undergraduate Literature Coordinator. Her research interests include Virginia Woolf as well as 19th and 20th century fiction. Um, her most recent publication is the book Virginia Woolf and the Professions, published by Cambridge University Press and it's out this year. So uh, please welcome our speaker and our moderator. Thank you very much. Thank you for that introduction. So good evening, everyone. It's my pleasure to introduce to you Professor <coughs> Douglas Kerr, our speaker for tonight, who will be speaking on his book, Conan Doyle Writing Profession and Practice, recently published by Oxford University Press. Um, professor Douglas Kerr is Professor of English and now also Dean of Arts. I've just found out, at the University of Hong Me Kong, too. where he's worked since, and this is also something I just found out, 1979. Um, <coughs> he's taught a wide range of periods and writers in literatures in English, but with a concentration on 19th and 20th century literature. His research interests in literary history include the literature of colonialism in Asia, the literature of war and of travel, and the history of literary modernism. Professor Kerr has had an extremely prolific career as a literary scholar. So besides the book on Conan Doyle, which is the subject of his talk today, he's also published three other important books, uh, Wilfred Owen's Voices, George Orwell, and Eastern Figures, Orient and Empire in British Writing. And apart from these books, he's also published numerous articles and book chapters, too many, in fact, to mention on this occasion. But again, they've been on a wide range and variety of writers. So this evening, Professor Kerr will speak for about 15 minutes on his new book. And after the talk, there will be half an hour for discussion and any questions that you may have for Professor Kerr. So ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Professor Douglas Kerr, writer of Conan Doyle, writing profession and practice. Thank you. <coughs> <coughs> Thank you very much, Evelyn. And uh, oh, there you <laughs> Thank you also, Peter, for that uh, interestingly generous introduction. And thank you all for coming. If anyone has come for Victor Hugo, he's downstairs. <laughs> so now would be the time to make the change. <coughs> but if you've come for Conan Doyle, you've come to the right place. And um, <coughs> This book was published last year. When I talk about this book, now we'll see if this works. Yep. I always like to begin with this picture, um, partly because it's the picture on the cover of my book, and it cost me a lot of money to get the permissions um, <coughs> to put that up there. But also, it's a, it's a good way of introducing <coughs> the topic today. If you look closely at the picture, you will see the large fellow sitting down <coughs> is Conan Doyle. And standing next to him, of course, everyone will recognize his most famous literary creation, the detective Sherlock Holmes. <coughs> and when you begin to look more closely, <coughs> you recognize that Conan Doyle is actually chained by his feet to the figure of Sherlock Holmes. He's shackled to him as if to represent uh, an association which he was not completely happy about, as a matter of fact. He felt as if um, 
this great creation of his, Sherlock Holmes, was someone that he couldn't ever quite escape from. And you will notice this is a, a picture uh, uh, by the great punch cartoonist Bernard Partridge, published in the 1920s, 1922, I think. You will see that Conidor has his head in the clouds, and he's looking upwards rather wistfully, whereas Sherlock Holmes is looking down towards the ground. They're, they're not looking at each other. This reminds me of that um, famous picture by Raphael called The School of Athens, which um, <coughs> depicts Plato and Aristotle in conversation together. And Plato is pointing upwards towards the heaven because he's an idealistic philosopher. And Aristotle is looking down towards the earth because he's much more practically and pragmatically minded. Well, what this picture represents, in fact, is a certain phase of Conan Doyle's reputation when he was nationally, indeed world famous, as the creator of Sherlock Holmes. But people were beginning to hear as well that he had another interest, and that was in spiritualism. And so what you see here is Conan Doyle sort of yearning towards the spiritual sphere, but unable to leave behind um, the very practical earthbound Sherlock Holmes, who of course made all his money for him. <coughs> so it's an appropriate image for my book in which I'm looking at the whole of Conan Doyle's work. Um, somebody said to me <coughs> just before coming here, oh, I didn't realize you were talking about Sherlock this evening. And I said, I'm not talking about Sherlock, I'm talking about Arthur. Um, <coughs> the whole of Conan Doyle's work, because of course the Sherlock Holmes stories were only a part of that work, very important part, but not the only part, and not the part that he himself was most invested in or most proud of. <coughs> So in my book, I look at all his work, his fiction, which is widespread and includes the detective stories, of course, his journalism, his history writing. <coughs> he was a military historian. Um, his spiritualist writing, several books in his last decade are about the life of the spirit. Um, <coughs> and his travel writing as well. So the whole body of his work. I call this the, the kind of book that I've written a cultural biography. That's a perhaps a rather pretentious way of describing it. Um, <clears throat> there are plenty of biographies of Conan Doyle, lots and lots of them, and some of them are very good. But I'm not interested in writing a, another narrative autobiography that says he was born here, he went to school, blah, blah, blah. Um, <clears throat> the biographies of that kind move from the outside to the inside. They, when they concern a writer, they tell you the details of his life, and then they project the details of that life onto the writing to try and help you understand it. Um, <clears throat> and what I'm trying to do with my cultural biography is um, to go in the other direction. <clears throat> so I'm starting from the works themselves and going from inside to outside. I'm taking the writing as my primary data, not the life, but taking the writing as the primary data in order to construct a picture of the writer and of his times, which were incidentally... Um, 1859 to 1930, that's his life. And I was just thinking this morning, it's uh, notable that he was born within only 10 years of the Crimean War, of course, not long after the Indian Rebellion, known as the Indian Mutiny. And he died less than 10 years before the outbreak of the Second World War. So it's a remarkable lifespan, um, <coughs> the story, of course, of modernity itself. So I do this through uh, looking at six what I call cultural domains, but if you like, six themes in Conan Doyle's life and writing. Um, <clears throat> and I'll tell you what these are because these will be the, the um, path that I take through this talk this evening. Um, first of all, the theme of sport. Secondly, the theme of medicine. He was a medical doctor, as you know. Thirdly, that of science. Fourth, law and order, which brings me in particular to the detective stories. Fifth, army and empire. And you might say that's a bit of a cheat because these are two different things. But I argue in the book that, in fact, for Conan Doyle, empire was very largely a military thing. That's what he was interested in about it. Um, and finally, the, <coughs> the domain of the spirit, which is where I hope to end up in this talk this evening. So I'm giving you a kind of, I shouldn't say this, I'm giving you a, a, a kind of uh, 
a reduction of, of the book here. I always say to my students, going to the lecture is not a substitute for reading the book. So, <coughs> um, <coughs> so how these different themes, such as sport, medicine, and so on, feed into Conan Doyle's work, <coughs> and then also to try to explain in looking at the writing how the work then feeds back into the society and culture that he inhabited, because I want to suggest that he is himself not only someone who lives in this society, but who describes it to other people, who, in a sense, makes it come real for other people. Um, <clears throat> so he's, I would say he's a creator of culture as well as a, an inhabitant of it. So that when <clears throat> people thought about the empire or thought about the professions or thought about um, medicine, for example, if they were readers of Conan Doyle, he had given them stories that helped them to think about these things and to understand them. Okay, <clears throat> and so that we don't get lost on this journey through the six domains, I'm going to anchor it um, inevitably uh, in the figure of Sherlock Holmes. I think I've got him. Um, <clears throat> the Holmes stories, short stories, as you probably know, were published in the Strand magazine, and they made this magazine famous and successful. Um, <clears throat> so there's Sherlock Holmes right at the, at the top of that. So I'll keep coming back to Sherlock Holmes as my kind of anchor point um, <clears throat> and show how these different domains relate to the Holmes stories, because that's the part of Conan Doyle's work that most of you, are, not me, but most of you are most interested in, I guess. Um, what makes Sherlock Holmes so fascinating? This is a, a very large question, as a matter of fact, and indeed he is fascinating and continues to be more than 100 years uh, <coughs> after his invention. Um, my answer would, would actually take an, a, another complete lecture, but it, briefly, it's, I think that he is such a multiplex character, not psychologically. He's not a particularly profound um, character, in, in, if you compare him to the characters of Henry James, for example. Um, <coughs> um, but in his functions, his social and cultural functions, a very multiplex character indeed. He is, for example, obviously a law and order man. He is a fighter of crime. <coughs> um, but, of course, he's an unofficial one. He's not a member of the police force. In fact, often finds himself... Um, arranged not so much against the police as kind of a, alongside them. And <coughs> though he is someone who upholds law and order, there is, a, I think you will agree, a very strong streak of anarchism in Sherlock Holmes. Um, he's not a well-behaved character at all. He's certainly not... He has very few of the social graces. He's very impolite to people. Um, <coughs> he goes his own way. And he's a very strange kind of person in whom to invest one's belief in law and order and social stability and so on. So that's one thing. He's a folk hero. Clearly he's a folk hero. And this is one of the things that enables him to be interpreted and reinterpreted um, <clears throat> right up to the present day. He's almost, you might say, a, a, almost a supernatural figure. He presides over the nation and particularly the city city of the great Victorian London that we all think of when we think of Sherlock Holmes with the fog and the handsome cabs and, and so on. He presides over that almost as a supernatural being, a tutelary deity guaranteeing its safety and its health and its continuance, um, <clears throat> almost like a god. And yet he's also a hero of a very modern kind, a hero, as I'll explain in a moment, for very much for a scientific age, even a technological hero, as a matter of fact. Um, <clears throat> so he's that too. He is a sportsman, both in the bodily and in the moral sense, and I'll try to explain that a bit later. But he's also an artist. If you look at the way that he's described, he's really an artist almost in the mode of those late 19th century artists like Oscar Wilde, for example. <clears throat> who sit around thinking, oh, modern life is terribly boring. Let's do something exciting and entertaining in order to, uh, to redeem the ennui of modern life. <coughs> so he's an aesthete. He's a version of what in the late 19th century following on Baudelaire was called the dandy. He's a dandy. He's, he's a great show-off. 
and an egotist <coughs> and thinks of himself as using his particular skills to craft into order the boring and mundane details of everyday life. <coughs> he's a scientist, as I've said. He's a patriot. He's a brain man, a cerebral hero, a guy who gets his success by thinking about things. But as a matter of fact, he's also an action man. Um, <coughs> not perhaps to the extent that Robert Downey Jr. presents him as such, but he's, uh, when roused to action, he's very vigorous and very formidable. Um, <coughs> and he's a man. He's a figure of masculinity. My predecessor in the deanship, Professor Cam Louie, should really give his attention to the question of masculinity in the Sherlock Holmes stories. And finally, he is very importantly not a singular figure but part of a double act. And when we think of Sherlock Holmes, we must think of Dr. Watson as well. And this, the success of the formula of the Holmes stories depends to my mind entirely on that extraordinary relationship, which actually is very, very deep uh, in emotional terms and gets reinterpreted in all sorts of ways <coughs> in later uh, versions. So he, they, these two, Holmes and Watson, are as inseparable as Laurel and Hardy <coughs> or as Don Quixote and Sancho Panza, one of the great pairings of literature. Okay, so starting with sports, <coughs> I made a list here of all the sports that Conan Doyle participated in. I'm not talking about the sports that he enjoyed watching, such as field athletics, for example. The sports that he participated in include boxing, rugby, soccer, or football, cricket, um, here's a picture of, this is actually a picture of Conan Doyle being bowled out by a famous cricketer called A.P. Lucas, who is, I think, the captain of Surrey. And this incident appears in one of his stories. So boxing, rugby, soccer, cricket, golf, hunting, skiing. He was one of those people who popularized the sport of skiing in uh, much to the benefit of the Swiss tourist industry and the Austrian tourist industry. Um, recreational skiing, <coughs> he was one of the first to do that. Fencing, shooting, fishing, archery, well, these are all things he did. Um, cycling, ballooning, motor racing, motor bicycling, bowling, and billiards. It's not bad, not many people in this room <laughs> could, put, could uh, put together such a list, even of things we watch on the TV. But he did all of these things, very physically vigorous, and a man for whom health was very important. <coughs> He's one of the founders of Portsmouth Football Club, which is still a successful association football club. He was a member of the MCC, the Marylebone Cricket Club, which is the great cricket club in England. And on one occasion, th this is the most famous cricketer of all, the Victorian cricketer W.G. Grace, a great champion cricketer in his time. On one occasion, Conan Doyle succeeded in bowling him out. It was one of the great moments of his life. So Conan Doyle was actually a pretty good amateur cricketer <coughs> and played sometimes for the MCC and um, <coughs> joined up with people like Grace. Many of Conan Doyle's stories are about sports of various kinds. There are plenty of cricketing stories, for example. There are golfing stories. <coughs> Boxing was probably his favorite sport of all. He learned to box when he was a, a medical student at Edinburgh and continued boxing um, as long as he was physically capable of doing it. Um, <coughs> and one of his novels, Rodney Stone, is entirely about the sport of pugilism, uh, boxing, as it was practiced in the Regency years, about the time of the Napoleonic Wars. Conan Doyle was very fascinated in this. In those days, the boxing champions were great celebrities, and they would organize a, a match somewhere out in the open on the Sussex Downs, for example. Tens of thousands of people turned up to witness these um, sporting bouts of sporting prowess, and of course to bet on them as well. So he has a whole novel about boxing. Um, <coughs> why was he so interested in sport? He was a doctor, he was interested in health, um, and sports were of course a way of, of keeping healthy. Um, but sports were also interested him, I think, in ethical terms. He's a writer for whom concepts such as fair play were very important. Ideas such as teamwork mattered a great deal. And like many of his Victorian contemporaries, he found these things exemplified 
and practiced on the sporting field. <coughs> so I said earlier, Sherlock Holmes is a sportsman. I don't mean that Sherlock Holmes turned out to play for Portsmouth Football Club or whatever, but he is ethically a sportsman. He's a man who doesn't cheat. He believes in <coughs> playing fair. Um, <coughs> and he is, in incidentally, also a man who, in spite of his occasional and, we must say, deplorable lapses into drug taking, but <coughs> only when he doesn't have anything to do, um, <coughs> apart from those lapses, he's actually in pretty good health. Um, <coughs> Conradon, I described as a, 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 good amateur a good amateur cricketer who turned out for the MCC and played in quite important matches, including against professionals. But the kind of cricket that he enjoyed most was really amateur. I mean, really amateur. And his favorite team was a team which was called the Allah Akbaris because it was... Um, <coughs> organized by this guy in the middle. Oh, this is not going to work, I'm afraid. Oh, there. Can you see this fellow in the middle with the moustache? Well, I have moustaches. Um, <coughs> J.M. Barry, the playwright, the inventor of Peter Pan, um, <coughs> a famous amateur cricketer who got together this team of complete no-hopers and deadbeats, <laughs> uh, with the exception of Conan Doyle. So these are all artists and journalists and, and so on. Um, <coughs> enthusiasts might notice there, second to the left of the back row, that's the young P.G. Woodhouse, who <coughs> also played for this team, but many other sort of Jerome K. Jerome and other writers that you would recognize. These people were terrible. <coughs> they never won a match. Uh, and th it's interesting that Conan Doyle, who could actually play well, what he enjoyed most was turning out with these guys in order to enjoy the solidarity, the, the team spirit, the humor of real amateur sports. <coughs> this is actually quite a serious um, theme in Conan Doyle, the theme of the amateur and the professional. And these are important themes in Victorian culture itself, which saw there had, be, there had always been professional sportsmen. I mentioned the professional boxers in the early part of the century. Late in the 19th century, you get the emergence of the amateur coming largely out of the public schools, that is, the private schools in England, um, <coughs> and embracing a, an ethic, an ethos of <laughs> fair play sports, which you played in order to enjoy the game. If you were an amateur, you didn't really care whether you won or not. You tried to win but winning didn't matter so much to you, so much as playing the game. <coughs> now, this is important when it comes to Sherlock Holmes. I was saying I'll bring every theme back to Sherlock Holmes. What is Sherlock Holmes after all? Is he an amateur or is he a professional? And the answer is, very interestingly, of course, both. He is a professional detective. He calls himself the first consulting detective. He is, in terms of technique, far advanced um, when compared with the, these lumbering plods of the, of the police force. So in some respects, everyone else beside him looks like an amateur. He's the professional. In another respect, however, of course, he is an amateur. Why is he doing this detecting? Is he doing it for a living? He is not. Is he doing it in order to get paid for his work? As a matter of fact, in many stories, he doesn't get paid at all. He's doing it for the interest, for the pleasure, for the enjoyment of exercising a skill. And he's even, I would venture to say, doing it for exercise in the way that you might um, indulge in your sporting hobby for exercise. So he's a curious amalgam of the amateur and professional, which makes him ideologically quite complicated, I think. Holmes, for most of the time, works for fun. He works, as we might say, for sport. <coughs> and he works in order to banish ennui, um, boredom, this kind of feeling of, of staleness and repetition, which haunted so many writers and other people in the 19th century. If you think of the French poet Baudelaire, the specialist of ennui, he's sitting around at home all the time thinking, oh, there's nothing new out there. What am I going to do? Life is so bourgeois and boring. Sherlock Holmes is like that. When he doesn't have any work to do, he's lying on his couch, you know, take, taking his drugs and saying, God, it's so boring here. But the moment he gets something to do, 
he's up and running. So he's like a sportsman who's actually taking exercise in order to almost to, to redeem the, the, the staleness and the repetition of his life. <coughs> so that's sports, the exercise of skill and style. Medicine... Um, <coughs> Medicine. Medicine, and, and Evelyn knows more about this than I do. Um, <coughs> medicine was, of course, a profession, one of the professions that, that we're particularly interested in. And in the 19th century, medicine became more and more professional as you move through the, uh, through the decades. Um, what that meant was uh, partly that people were getting better at it, but in particular that a certain class of people were emerging who were consecrated as doctors. Um, <clears throat> and the other people, because for many hundreds of years, plenty of people, have, anyone could practice medicine, you or I could practice medicine, if we could persuade someone to come and be treated by us. So there were millions around about the country. There were all sorts of folk practitioners and midwives and magic men and... Um, <clears throat> Uh, untrained practitioners. Through the 19th century, the profession begins to consolidate. Um, <clears throat> there's a series of Acts of Parliament that instantiate the profession. Now, later in the 19th century, you cannot claim to be a doctor unless you've passed the exams, unless you've got the qualifications. So this is professionalizing the profession. One of the things that it's doing is excluding all of these people who don't have the qualifications, who can't afford to go through the medical education. So medicine is becoming, for one thing, much more respectable. If you look at the way that um, doctors are regarded in Moliere, for example, in the 17th century, quacks for the most part. But the status of the doctor is rising in society. <coughs> Conan Doyle went to one of the great medical schools at the University of Edinburgh, where he qualified and went into practice as a general practitioner down in South Sea on the south coast of England. <clears throat> now, one of the, the things that had emerged in this process of professionalization of the medical, of medicine in the 19th century was a certain career structure so that the medical profession consisted of basically two classes of people. The large majority were the general practitioners. These were what we might call the family doctors, okay? And these people had a, a practice in a particular area, part of town or, or stretch of countryside. They treated all the diseases and ailments that came across their threshold. They were local. They had to get to know their community very well, often personally knowing many of the people who lived round about them. So the general practitioners, and Conan Doyle was one of those. But at the top of the profession, there was an elite who were the consultants. These people had more qualifications than the general practitioners. They read up on the medical literature. They were more modern. They knew all the, the latest techniques and treatments and drugs and so on. These people were the aristocrats of the profession. And the way it worked was that if you had some <laughs> ailment, you went to your general practitioner, and your general practitioner maybe wasn't a particularly gifted doctor, but he sort of gave you some uh, encouragement, maybe a few pills, and hoped that um, you would go away. Um, <clears throat> but if the problem was too difficult for the general practitioner, you would be, the same thing today, you would be referred to a consultant. And the consultant was much more expensive, and the consultant was much more modern. The consultant was also specialized. You would specialize in the lungs or or the eyes, or something like that. So the profession had two classes, a majority of general practitioner at the bottom, a minority of sort of elite of consultants at the top. And this, it seems to me, is a really important um, uh, model, a really important paradigm for the way that Conan Doyle thinks about society and also about relationships. <coughs> what is Sherlock Holmes' answer? consultant. This is one of the first things that he tells Watson. Watson moves in with him without knowing what he does. What do you do? I'm a consultant detective, the first of my kind. Okay? So he's the specialist. He's the elite. And you must think of the police force as the, the sort of pretty useless general practitioners. 
um, <clears throat> the, generally, the general practitioner goes to visit the patient in their, in their dwelling. But the patient has to go to visit the consultant, often in the big city in London. Okay? Um, <clears throat> and Sherlock Holmes is, is a consultant. People come to him. If you think of the first page of many of the Sherlock Holmes stories, it is a scene of consultancy. Somebody comes knocking on the door. Mr. Holmes, I've got a problem. Sit down, describe your symptoms. Give me your history. Oh, well, it's like this, and, and I've been to the police, and they can't help, or I'm unable to solve this. And Holmes himself then acts as a consultant. Using his expertise, he basically solves the problem, more or less. Um, and Conan Doyle, who, remember, had been a general practitioner, knew what consultants were like. And he knew that they were um, often very impatient with other people, often snobbish, um, <clears throat> often aggressive. I'm sure this is not the case with any consultants at the, the medical faculty of the University of Hong Kong, but it happens. Um, <clears throat> and often very condescending to the general practitioner, to the local guy. Because basically the general practitioner is, in referring a patient to a consultant, is admitting that the problem is beyond the GP, you can't do it. So the consultants enjoyed, I'm sure, putting down the general practitioner. Well, think then of the relationship between Holmes and Watson. And, you, and Watson is or becomes a general practitioner. Holmes is not a doctor, but he's a consultant. And I think that that sort of social paradigm, that professional paradigm, the consultant and the general practitioner, makes its way into that essential relationship between the two. It's not all one-way traffic, because, of course, Watson still has many things that Holmes doesn't have. For example, a heart. And very often, Watson is the one who responds as a human being, sympathetically, towards these people who are brought into the consulting room at Baker Street and whom Holmes regards largely as a case. One of the collections is called the case book of Sherlock Holmes. This is a medical term. Okay? Holmes processes human problems into cases, and then he solves them as a professional. But Watson is much, though he's intellectually more slow, Watson is much more ready to feel sorry for the people who come to see Holmes, which Holmes very rarely does, to respond to them as human beings. There's a wonderful moment in, in um, The Sign of Four where Watson meets his wife, uh, <coughs> where Mary Morstan comes in to consult Sherlock Holmes. And the first section of Holmes' story is always the same. Mr. Holmes, here I've got this problem. Can you help me? <coughs> She, and Holmes, who prides himself on being the great observer, he's very good at observing, he listens to her and says, yes, I will help you. She goes away. And Watson says to Holmes, oh, she was really pretty, wasn't she? And Holmes says, I did not observe. So his observation, that of an expert, is very, very narrowly focused. Watson is the generalist. Um, <coughs> the more old-fashioned, the less scientific practitioner. Okay, this brings me into science, and of course, we think of the 19th century, we think of the great scientific optimism which had been generated by the Enlightenment in Europe, the end of the 17th through the 18th century. The many, many hugely important scientific discoveries, first in the, <coughs> in the um, physical sciences, later in the life sciences, later through the 19th century into what are miscalled the social sciences. Um, <clears throat> so there seems to be a trajectory of discovery and improvement in science, generating a great optimism that many of the material problems of the world can be solved by science. Um, <clears throat> an optimism and a positivism that comes with this. Conan was certainly not immune to this. Um, he thought of himself as a scientist, one of his great fictional heroes, apart from Holmes himself, is Professor Challenger, um, the hero of the, the Lost World and other stories of that. So here's an example of a really, I say, a really boyish idealization of the scientist as hero, the, the great intellectual intrepidly devoted to uncovering the truth and to discovering um, 
new, all sorts of new realms of material knowledge. Holmes, too, is a scientist. I should have left behind. Oh, I should. Let me go back to boxing for a moment. I forgot to say. Uh, this is home, uh, illustration from a Holmes story. I wanted to show it to you because look at the stance of Sherlock Holmes. He's having a fight there with a, with a bad guy. And Holmes is very classical. He's boxing like someone who knows what they're doing. He's been trained to box like that. That's how you do it. The other guy is all over the place. Um, <clears throat> so I was talking about the, import the sort of ethical importance of sport. Here's an example of how sport translates into bodily and moral uprightness, as exemplified by Sherlock Holmes. The other guy, you can tell that he's a villain because his body is all out of shape and he's not doing it properly and he's going to lose that fight. Sorry, I should have... Um, okay, this is science. <laughs> this is to remind you that Sherlock Holmes himself is a scientist, remember? He has chemical apparatus in his uh, home <coughs> at uh, Baker Street. Um, <coughs> the greatest of all scientists, perhaps, in the 19th century, Charles Darwin, um, the expounder of the theory of evolution, was one who had an enormously important effect on the intellectual and emotional life of people in the 19th century, um, Conan Doyle included, and many hundreds and thousands of people who took on the lessons of Darwin, uh, the way that Darwin had explained the development of, of biology, the development of life, and seemed to have explained it in a way that did not require the intervention of a creator. For many people, this meant the end of their traditional Christian faith. And Conan Doyle was one of them. He was brought up as a Christian, a Catholic, as a matter of fact. When he read Darwin and the other scientists, he lost his faith and he never returned to a conventional kind of faith. Um, so there seemed then to be a kind of fight between science and religion, which science was winning, <coughs> um, as it seemed to someone of a scientific education like Conan Doyle himself. So in many of his books, science, the, science is the hero. Um, there is a, a romance of science um, <coughs> in terms of, of discovery and the courage of scientists um, <coughs> and so on. And the um, praise in the Sherlock Holmes stories of the business of observation, so important to Sherlock Holmes, and of course it's the entire basis of science itself, is it not? Observation, which is not clouded by emotion or opinion or anything of that kind. Observation, which tells it as it is. Um, <coughs> the Science of Deduction is the title of an early chapter in the two first Sherlock Holmes books, as if to, um, to emphasize the case. But the downside of this was that scientific objectivity and disinterestedness, upon which all of Victorian science was based, scientists were taught, you mustn't be personal. Leave your personality outside the laboratory. Simply describe what's there. As far as Conan Doyle was concerned, this could lead to a deficit in emotion. In other words, an over emphasis upon reason and disinterested observation could lead to a lack of humanity. And there are many of his stories, too, in which we see a scientist, however brilliant, um, who is unable to cope with his emotional life, for example, is unable to deal with his family properly, because he, or she, but usually he, is so specialized in this disinterested discourse of science, um, that they become cold, they become materialistic, focused on the material world which you can observe and measure, and believing that there is nothing other than the material world. And Conan Doyle came to feel that this was a great weakness of the scientific age that he lived in. And, of course, the opposite of materialism is spiritualism. Um, <clears throat> that's to remind you about Sherlock Holmes and the science of observation and deduction. <clears throat> Again, Watson, I think, is the antidote to this, the humanistic investigation. Law and order, uh, <coughs> I need to hurry on. Um, the first Sherlock Holmes story was published in 18... 88. This is what was happening in London in 1887. Um, <clears throat> the riot in Trafalgar Square on the day that became known journalistically as Bloody Sunday. 
This is a large demonstration against um, rising unemployment and also against what the, the Conservative government was doing in Ireland. Um, <clears throat> it got out of hand and the police, the Metropolitan Police behaved, as you can see represented there perhaps, very brutally and they laid into many of the um, demonstrators. Um, a couple of people were killed, many were injured. It was a great scandal. <clears throat> and represented, there was a huge backlash in, in um, the newspapers and in public opinion against the Metropolitan Police who didn't seem to know what they were doing. So that's 1887, there's a crisis in the police and it's made worse of course in 1888, the year in which the first Sherlock Holmes story was published is also the year of the most famous of all English crimes. Um, the Whitechapel murders attributed to Jack the Ripper, the murderer who was never, as far as we know, identified in a series of horrible murders of women in the East End of London. <clears throat> and again, the police got a lot of flack for this because um, in spite of all their efforts, they were unable to identify the perpetrator and he was never found, as far as we know. So Sherlock Holmes, interestingly, comes on the scene at a time when the police are in real trouble. Um, <clears throat> but the way that the police are represented in the home stories is actually quite reassuring. The police are not, the, they're not brutal um, <clears throat> and they're not completely incompetent either, they're just rather slow. Um, <clears throat> and as a matter of fact, uh, with a lot of hard work on their part, the police force after the uh, Ripper uh, episode began slowly to improve their status in society and to be regarded um, as more trustworthy, more efficient than they had been before. And I have a feeling that the home stories may have had something to do with that because if you think of Inspector Lestrade and Gregson and so on, they're, they're not always intellectually all that bright. But they are reliable, they are honest, they don't take bribes, for example. Um, <clears throat> they're, they're actually not a bad advertisement for the police force. So the police were coming into greater favour uh, during the lifetime, say the lifetime of Sherlock Holmes actually, the time when the Holmes stories were being produced. Um, <clears throat> and at the end, end of Conan Doyle's life in 1930, their status had really never been higher and they were very much trusted um, by the public, though by the middle class public, the police were regarded as slightly lower class as really a form of servants, but a reliable bunch of servants, um, <coughs> servants of the people. Sherlock Holmes then is a lawman. He serves law and order, he keeps the peace, he catches the criminals. Um, <coughs> but he's, uh, I think it's, it's interesting that if you ask in the Sherlock Holmes stories, how much interest is there in the process of the law, the institution of the law, the answer is almost none. When does, in the Sherlock Holmes stories, when are we invited to, into a law court to see a, a, a criminal prosecution? Answer, never. When do we go, when do we visit um, the prisons to see how uh, criminals are being treated in jail? Never. Um, <clears throat> what interest is there in the law itself, the way that it is legislated and um, the way that it's administered and the way that it's enforced? Answer, almost none. And I don't think Conan Doyle knew very much about it, actually, in the early years when he was doing Sherlock Holmes. And this is because Sherlock Holmes is not really a lawman, you see. He's really a problem solver. Um, <clears throat> the, these cases come across his doorstep as intellectual puzzles to be solved. As a matter of fact, he is in the business often, of course not in all stories, he's often in the business of um, solving crimes and, and putting the criminals away, but he doesn't really care about that. We never see, after Holmes identifies the murderer, it was him, then what? We don't know, the police take over, end of story, okay? Conan Doyle doesn't seem to have been interested in what happens after the criminal has been identified. Where is he taken? How is he interrogated? Does he, do the police get a confession? Does he go to court? How does it work out? What is his long-term future? None of that. Once the problem is solved, end of story, literally. <clears throat>
So I think it's a curious thing when you think about it that he's actually very little interested in what for many later uh, crime writers became the essential part of crime writing, that is procedure, you know, police procedure. Um, you find very little of that in, um, <coughs> in the Sherlock Holmes stories, nor will you find much interest in why people are criminals. The social causes of crime, for example, the relation, the things that, that Dickens was so interested in, the relation between crime and, and bad housing, poor education, breakdown of family, and so on. He's not much interested in that. His main criminal, Moriarty, is really a figure from a fairy tale and a, a great villain, um, but we are not asked to be at all interested in how he became one. He's just there. He's the kind of mirror image of, of Sherlock Holmes, um, <coughs> his shadow self. But no, none of this realistic uh, investigation of how people become criminals um, Holmes simply, crimes come up and he swats them away. That's the process that he's interested in. He does it through being smart, through observing and deducing. But there's very little social realism in the Holmes stories. <coughs> However, outside the Holmes stories and later in his life, as you know, Conradol became involved in a number of criminal cases because he was very famous as the creator of Holmes, and people were constantly writing to him saying, please investigate, you know, my cat has run away or something. But occasionally, I've been sent to prison for something I didn't do, can you help me? And some of these uh, cases, famously, he did uh, help with, the case of George Edelgy is, is one, um, in which a, a man had been very shamefully, and by a great miscarriage of justice, been locked away for something he didn't do. So um, apart from the Sherlock Holmes stories, Conan Doyle is drawn into questions of law and order, questions of policing, the magistracy and how it works, uh, corruption, uh, <coughs> and so on in actual life. And these cases, I think, are important in turning him into what I shall argue is the strangely radical figure that he became in the last decades of his life. Um, he became very disillusioned. The Edelgy case, the Oscar Slater case would be another one, where he saw at first hand how crooked the, pre the real police could be, how unfair the real magistrates could be, how the Home Secretary didn't care, and so on. The whole system from, from the House of Lords down to the policeman on the beat could produce real injustice and genuine undeserved um, human suffering. And um, this was important for him. Army and Empire, I have to deal with this quite quickly because I'm, I'm sort of going slower than I intended. And I've, of course, forgot to... Oh, there's the police. There they are. <coughs> um, <coughs> they let in one in the back row with a huge beard, but the rest of them were properly mustachioed. Um, <coughs> OK, Army and Empire. Um, if you lived in Conan Doyle's lifetime, you lived in a time in which the British won all their wars. Um, <clears throat> and you lived in a time in which the empire expanded from the middle of the 19th century um, <clears throat> rapidly through the late 19th century, even um, with another spurt after the end of the First World War when they picked up a lot of German colonies. So the empire was going in one direction, which was bigger. Um, <coughs> and the army, although uh, it had its moments of uh, incompetence and disaster, generally won its wars in, in the end. Um, <coughs> it's a time when someone like Conan Doyle growing up in the middle of the century would have been brought up on boys' adventure stories. Excuse me. Um, set in the empire, starring imperial heroes, boys who marched with Wellington or Wolf in Canada or took part in, put down rebellions in India, or worked on the northwest frontier of Afghanistan. There was a great supply, a, a great sort of archive of heroic stories placed in and confirming the empire itself. Particularly, this is very much a masculine discourse. The story is about boys and men. <coughs> Conador was enthralled by soldiers all through his life. I think he would really have liked to be one. And he tried a couple of times to get into the army, but he was at that time too old, unfortunately. Um, <coughs> he was enthralled by soldiers, not only in the present day, 
um, the, the Vic late Victorian wars that um, he knew about, but also the soldiers of the past. And the aspect of his work he was most proud of was, in fact, his historical novels. Um, <coughs> the White Company, I'm sorry, it's not a very good reproduction, but it's a story of medieval warfare. It's a story about the Hundred Years' War in the reign of King Edward III, which Conan thought was the great age of the English. And they were fighting wars against the French. Um, so he sets uh, several of his, his, his own favorite stories <coughs> at that time. And incidentally, I should say that um, though we think of him as, the, of course, the author of Sherlock Holmes. When it came to book sales, this book sold better than any of the Sherlock Holmes books, The White Company and its um, uh, prequel, Sir Nigel. <coughs> So English historical novels, there was a great taste for these, which Conan Doyle himself, of course, fed. The other historical period that, he, that really excited him was the Napoleonic Wars. And there's a book to be written, surely, about the cult of Napoleon in England um, <coughs> in the 19th century. So Napoleonic adventures and medieval ones, too. <coughs> he tried to get into the action. He found himself in Egypt in 1895, when the British very conveniently were starting a war in the Sudan. So he joined himself, attached himself to the British Army as a war correspondent, which you could do in those days. You just had to walk in. Um, <coughs> he dressed himself up in what he thought was a military uniform. He got an enormous pistol to carry, and he got on a camel and rode with General Kitchener and his troops south, um, <coughs> uh, upstream along, along the Nile, in order to engage the Khalifa, who was the the successor of the Mahdi, if you know the, the rebellion in Sudan in which General Gordon was killed, uh, the, the Mahdi, the great uh, leader himself, died and was succeeded by the Khalifa. The British decided they needed to punish this great um, humiliation that they had suffered, so they sent the army <coughs> south to, to search for him. Conan Doyle, unfortunately, was on holiday and he had to go home after, after a few months before they'd actually seen any of the enemy. Um, <coughs> but the the uh, result of that campaign was the Battle of Omdurman a couple of years later in 1898, a, a great British imperial victory in which very large numbers of what the British called dervishes were slaughtered. <coughs> and this is the action in which famously it was the last cavalry charge in British military history. And um, taking part in that cavalry charge, as everybody knows, was a young journalist called Winston Churchill. Um, Conan Doyle wasn't there, but he was with the army in Egypt a couple of years earlier. <coughs> when the South African War came, the end of the 19th century, the Boer War, Conan Doyle tried to join up. He was very patriotic. Um, the army wouldn't have him, but he made his way to South Africa as a doctor with a medical mission and ended up in the city of Bloemfontein when there was a, a typhus epidemic. Really horrible. So he worked very hard treating the soldiers suffering from this terrible disease. So he did his bit, um, <coughs> and later on wrote a couple of books about it. Um, this, too, was an opportunity for him to get into uniform. There he is, posing a, in a st obviously a studio portrait. Um, and there he is again. I think it's the same artificial rock that he's sitting on there. So he was patriotic, and he was certainly an imperialist. He was very much in favor of... Uh, the empire, but not empire as a whole. And one of the most creditable parts of his career was his campaign against the atrocities in the Belgian Congo in the early years of the 20th century. Um, <coughs> King Leopold of Bel well, this is a long story, but um, the people in Central Africa were being very cruelly exploited uh, <coughs> and, um, in some cases, wholesale murdered um <coughs> by the Belgians. And Conan Doyle got got to hear about this and joined the campaign uh, to try and get the Belgian, uh, to try and get King Leopold outlawed and to stop these, this gross exploitation going on in the Congo, which is also incidentally the subject of Joseph Conrad's Heart of Darkness, uh, written a few years before. <coughs> so Conan Doyle wrote an interesting title for a crime writer. He wrote a novel called The Crime of the Congo. And he said, what's going on now in the Congo is the worst crime that has ever been committed in human history, and it must be stopped. So not, empire wasn't always good, but when the British did it, it was usually good as far as he was concerned, <coughs> because they, as everybody knows, took care of the local people and, um, and were efficient and so on. 
So masculinity comes in here. Um, <coughs> Holmes is, in some respects, an imperial hero, I would suggest. Um, <coughs> and he's a hero in the mold of many of these adventure stories that Conan Doyle had enjoyed so much as a boy. The celibacy of Holmes is part of this, too. Holmes famously is uninterested in women. And many of these adventure stories have a character completely male cast. There are no women at all. Or maybe the women are there on page one, saying goodbye, and they're there on the last page saying, oh, you, you survived, welcome back. Um, but mostly it's a, it's a boy's game. <coughs> and the, the, the home stories are, of course, also boy's games. Masculinity, celibacy, chivalry, because although Holmes doesn't, is not interested in women, he protects them. He looks after women. He sees that that's part of what it means to be a man. Um, <coughs> okay, this brings me then to my last domain, the domain of spirit. <coughs> For me, this last chapter in the book was the most difficult one to write, actually, because Conan Doyle's involvement in the realm of spirit is a complicated thing. Um, <coughs> and here we leave Sherlock Holmes behind for the first time, because very interestingly, Sherlock Holmes is not involved in any of Conan Doyle's spiritualist writing. Thank God, you might say, he doesn't, get, doesn't tell a story about how Sherlock Holmes is converted to belief in ghosts and, and um, mediums and so on. He keeps that separate. Professor Challenger, I mentioned before, his great scientist hero, actually is. And there's a late novel called The Land of Mist in which Professor Challenger, who starts off, like most scientists, very skeptical about spiritualism and the whole idea of survival after death and contacting the dead. Um, <coughs> but in the course of that story, he is converted to spiritualism and becomes a campaigner for the cause. And of course, it's very important that he is the great scientist. So the great scientist, too, becomes a spiritualist. And Conan Doyle thought that he was in the same case. He developed his beliefs in spiritualism in the survival after death, the ability of particularly gifted people to contact the dead, to be possessed by the spirit of the dead and to channel messages from the dead and all that. He converted to this kind of belief without ever sacrificing his belief in science, or so he said. And he came to believe that these spiritualist phenomena which he had witnessed were scientifically attested. So he said, I'm not giving up my rationalism. I'm not giving up my observation. These things I know to be true. I'm a scientist. Trust me, I've seen them happen. Well, it's a long story. Getting the tone of Conan Doyle's spiritualism right is, is a bit difficult. Modernity, remember, had seemed to be scientific. Science had seemed to be the generator of, of progress and, and um, improvement and uh, material prosperity and greater understanding and all of these things. Um, <coughs> we've had, as we've seen, the rise of an independent scientific culture, the appearance of professional scientists for the first time. And later in the, in the 19th century, these people were, were gathering in universities. Um, <coughs> and with Darwin and positivism, as I hinted before, it seemed that the fundamentals of religious belief were being challenged. Many people lost their faith. It's a cliche Victorian story, the loss of faith in the, the face of, of Darwin's discoveries <coughs> or theories. Conan Doyle lost his faith too. So he's participating, if you like, in, in, a, in, in a widespread, a cultural loss of faith, faith. This is not just something personal happening to him. Many people were in the same boat. But for him, it left a gap. It left a kind of open wound which needed to be healed. <coughs> he says in his autobiography, quote, when religion is dead, materialism becomes active. When religion is dead, materialism becomes active. And by materialism, he meant lots of things. In particular, he meant the scientific view of things which says that there are only material, the world consists only of material objects. Spiritual stuff, you can't see it, you can't measure it, it can't exist. The afterlife, how can we measure it? How can we see it? We can't. Therefore, it doesn't exist. So materialism is like Sherlock Holmes in that early picture, looking down at the earth and saying, this is what we know. This is what we can measure. This is what we can improve. 
anything other than that is just fantasy, it's just fairy tales. So when religion is dead, materialism becomes active. But he also meant materialism in the other sense, the sense of getting and spending, the sense that we use it here in Hong Kong if we think of ourselves as a materialistic society, a society that's interested in goods and possessions and money much more than it's interested in ideas and feelings. Um, <coughs> Materi a materialistic society, though it might be more affluent in general, was also reductive and it was competitive. Materialism sets people against one another. If I want to enrich myself, I'm enriching myself at your expense. And he thought that this was, um, uh, he th actually thought it was decadent. <coughs> and so, like many other people in the 19th century, he turned to the possibility of alternatives. In the early 19th century, people had been fooling around with mesmerism, for example. In the middle of the 19th century, you get the invention of the word telepathy. And people are starting to do experiments, like I lock you in another room, you think of the color, do I think of the same color in this room, etc., to see whether they could, in a sense, refute materialism by showing that ideas could move independent of material bodies. Could be trans thoughts could be transferred from one person to another at a distance, telepathy. Um, <coughs> uh, and lots of magic and what we would now call new agey stuff, theosophy, enormously important in the late 19th and early 20th century, um, <coughs> with its sort of very orientalist mumbo jumbo about Tibetan sages and levitation and all this kind of stuff. Uh, very fashionable in, in Europe <coughs> around about 1900. Uh, the belief in magic. And I'm talking about, uh, I'm not talking about stupid people here. I'm talking about someone like the poet W.B. Yeats, for example, who took all this stuff very seriously indeed and was a member of the Golden Dawn and Madame Blavatsky's Circus and all the rest of it. Um, <coughs> The Society for Psychical Research was set up by scientists who wished to investigate the phenomena that were claimed for spiritualism, such as telepathy, such as mediumistic possession, and so on. So these were scientists who wanted to, of course, to expose the frauds, and most of these people were frauds, but also wanted to see whether there was some truth in these things, whether they could be scientifically attested. Conan Doyle, of course, was a member of that. Um, spiritualism, which was a movement that started in America in the middle of the 19th century, gradually acquired more adherence through the 19th century into the 20th century. Um, and then, of course, when the war came, the First World War, 1914 to 1918, when every family in Europe had lost somebody, a son or a, a, a brother or a father, there was a huge upsurge in interest in spiritualism, people going to, to so-called mediums to try to contact the dead, and the medium would say, oh, yes, I see a man, he's wearing a uniform, um, he says that he still loves you, that sort of thing. So there was a, a, undoubtedly a huge amount of fraud, but there were also mediums who were entirely sincere, um, <coughs> I have no doubt. Um, so Conan Doyle had been interested in this stuff from the 1870s. His convictions grew he experimented, I told you he was a scientist, he experimented and he observed. And at some time, probably in the 1880s, I think, he became convinced in the reality of the spiritual realm, in the survival of the spirit after death, and in the ability of the spirit to communicate with the living through various media. <coughs> in 1916, only in 1916, did he go public with these beliefs. And this is right in the heart of the First World War. And he writes and says, look, I believed in this stuff for a long time. I'm going public with this now in order to give comfort to all the people who have lost their loved ones because I can tell you for a fact you haven't lost them. They may be dead, but they haven't gone. And there's the possibility that you can contact them, they can speak to you. And when you go through death itself, it's not really death, but you're just going on to the next level of existence. <coughs> Um, <coughs> he took this enormously seriously, and in the last 10 years of his life, from 1920 to 1930, he devoted himself to, as a missionary, going around the world um, preaching the doctrines of spiritualism. And this brings me at last to the fairies. Okay. <coughs> oh, so th this is a spirit photograph. 
Um, <clears throat> and it's, it's very tragic, I think. Um, Conan Doyle lost his son in the last year of the war to the uh, Spanish influenza. And this is a photograph in which he believed that the spirit of his son had been captured on the photographic plate. That's his son. So he, he took this as a scientific proof of the survival of the spirit. It's, and of course, it's, uh, of course it's a fraud. And it's actually a pretty clumsy one as well. But um, many people wanted so very much to believe in the efficacy of this kind of thing that they were easily persuaded. Okay, the Cottingley Fairies. This is the last bit. Um, <coughs> after he came out as a spiritualist in 1916, Many of Conan Doyle's admirers started to drift away from him. The people who had enjoyed the Sherlock Holmes stories couldn't understand why this man had now gone soft and he was saying, oh, spirits and all this kind of stuff. He lost a lot of his, the reputation which had sustained him through his middle years. And he lost even more of it when he came out about the fairies. Here's the story, very briefly. In the north of England in Yorkshire, there's a small village called Cottingley and there, these two young girls, you can see them there, they were called Frances Griffiths and Elsie Wright, supposedly took photographs of fairies next to that river uh, that runs through the village of, of Cottingley. <coughs> and these photographs were disseminated, they were taken up by the theosophists. Conan Doyle came to see them, and when he saw them, he said, good Lord, this is proof in the existence of fairies, okay? Not only that, but he then wrote an article in Strand magazine, his sort of house magazine, saying, look, the existence of fairies has been proved. They exist in Yorkshire. Um, <coughs> and they have been photographed by these young girls. <coughs> and then in 1922, made it worse, he wrote a book called The Coming of the Fairies. It's a whole book about fairies, and he describes how the different colors in different parts of the world and all the rest of it. This pretty much discredited him with his enormous public. Nobody could believe that this old fool um, could possibly have fallen for this trick. And there was a lot of time was spent in, in investigating the photographs to see if the photographs had been faked. Of course, the photographs had not been faked, but the fairies had been faked. There's nothing wrong with the photograph. That is the photograph of a girl, but she's looking at a, a piece of paper that was cut out of a book and stuck in the ground with a hat pin. Um, <coughs> much later in life, when they were old ladies, the, the two girls confessed that um, the fairies weren't real, but <laughs> by that time, the damage was very much done. So this was very much to Conan Doyle's discredit at the end of his career. Um, <coughs> But I want to try to understand it in terms, this is the, the very last point I will make. In terms of that strange, I, I described him earlier um, as becoming a bit of a radical in later life. This is a man who, through most of his life, was an extremely establishment figure. Very much right in the center of the culture, his political beliefs, um, <coughs> and so on. In the last decade of his life, he moved away from that. He became disillusioned with the world round about him. He felt it, it no longer, he felt it had gone bad. It had become too materialistic. It had become decadent. Um, <coughs> and when the First World War came along, as far as he was concerned, this simply proved what was wrong. He, he felt that the First World War was a symptom, a, an effect of the materialism, of the lack of spirituality in in the world, particularly in Europe, in this phase of capitalism where everyone was, was belting around um, trying to compete with each other and get more money and so on. So he very much wanted to believe in something else, that there might be an alternative world, an alternative world that in some ways preserved those values which the world had once had, which we had now lost. We all moved into cities and, and started working for the government and so on. Um, <coughs> And I think what appealed to him in, in the pictures of the Cottingley fairies, that's another one, is that it is a version of pastoral. It's a version of, of the world as Conan Doyle wished that it still existed. Though here was evidence that there was a different way of living that had nothing to do with competition, had nothing to do with materialism, had nothing to do with war, had nothing to do with progress or modernity. 
indeed had nothing to do with masculinity. And it was the world depicted um, <coughs> in the Cottingley Fairies, an alternative England. So I'm going to finish, if you indulge me, just by reading um, a paragraph from the bit where I, I talk about this, and then I will stop. <coughs> Okay, so the place was called Cottingley. Oh, incidentally, his father was also interested in fairies. This is an illustration by his father, who was a, uh, a commercial uh, illustrator. So Carnival wasn't the only one. Let me go back to you just finish photographing that. It's a nice splash of color. Oh, I'll leave it up there. <coughs> Cottingley, like paradise, existed in both past and future. Yorkshire, where this, the fairies were supposed to have been seen, Yorkshire had been the great workshop of the Industrial Revolution, with Leeds and Bradford, where Elsie worked, at the centre of the textile industry, and at the time of the First World War, of armaments production. This was not the Yorkshire in which the fairies were photographed in 1917. Photographs were taken during the war. That country was one in which it might be possible, at least in the eyes of an outsider, to imagine that things were as they had always been. After the lengthy journey up from London, Gardner, Conan Doyle's co-author, found Cottingley, he said, a quaint old world village. To enter it was like stepping back into the past. Most obviously, it was the war itself that the enchanted dell teeming with fairies seemed to deny or defy. The grossest form of destructive materialism with its insane competition between nations, its infernal machines and dehumanizing organization. The fairies, let me go back to them. That's my favorite picture is actually this one. <clears throat> the fairies, so childlike, so frail and whimsical, were the opposite of this, as indeed they are in Robert Graves's wartime collection of poems, Fairies and Fusiliers, published in 1918. They, the fairies, and the girls who were pure enough to see them and play with them were a covenant, an assurance that the true spirit of England survived, indigenous and innocent. It could be argued then that Conan Doyle believed in the fairies in the same way that he believed in Elsie and Francis, the young girls who saw them. For him, they embodied a possibility, a kind of England that, however naively, he was determined to assert. Far from the metropolis, far from the world made and spoiled by men, here was a form of life that was feminine, young, playful, and neighborly. Its appearance in these unpropitious times seemed to herald a change. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Um, we, we can't actually get away from Sherlock Holmes. Um, <coughs> that's a cartoon that I came across recently. You know, um, Conan Doyle tried to get rid of Sherlock Holmes by, by pushing him down the, in a story down the Reichenbach Falls, but it didn't work. He came back. <laughs> <laughs> and so, actually, if you... Uh, the real proof that there can be life after death is here. <laughs> Thank you. <coughs> Thank you so much, Douglas, for taking us on that wonderful journey of Conan Doyle's life. <coughs> I'm sure I speak for many in the audience here when, when I say that. Um, the organization of Conan Doyle's life through these cultural and historical themes has been really, really illuminating. So thank you so much. You. Um, we now have about half an hour for discussion. So if you have any questions for Professor Kerr, you can ask them now. So does anyone have any first questions? If not, I'm going to start us off, because okay. I think the audience is a bit shy, so I'll give them a bit more time to think about their first question. Actually, um, I'm going to ask you a question on this. Uh -huh. <laughs> yes. What do you think Conan Doyle would have made of the afterlife of Holmes? Uh -huh. And I, I can see the audience thinking about um, Benedict Cumberbatch here, of course. <laughs> so what do you think Conan Doyle would have made of all that? Um, Actually, the, the afterlife of Sherlock Holmes started before the death of Sherlock Holmes, as it were, <coughs> because already in the early years of the 19th century, the very, very early years of, um, uh, of cinema, there started to be 
films of Sherlock Holmes. But before that, in the 1890s, I think, um, Sherlock Holmes made it onto the stage, not in Conan Doyle's script, but there was an act, a famous American actor called Gillette, William Gillette, I think, who made a career as impersonating Sherlock Holmes. Um, <coughs> so Gillette wrote a number of dramas, uh, invo some of them based on Sherlock Holmes stories and some of them not. Some of them uh, new, newly made up stories. And uh, early on in the process, because of course there was a question of copyright and so on, and Con Conan Doyle was getting paid for these. Um, <coughs> and uh, Gillette sent a telegram to Conan Doyle saying, can I marry Sherlock Holmes? Uh, not meaning could he himself get married to Sherlock Holmes, but in the play, is it all right if I find him a wife? And Conan Doyle sent a telegram back saying, you can marry him or kill him or anything you like. So as far as he was concerned, he had a, a rather healthily unproprietorial uh, attitude towards his creation. He, did, he made a lot of money, of course, out of Holmes in all sorts of forms. So there were dramatic versions of Holmes. There were early silent movie versions uh, of Holmes, um, many of them using trick the trick photography that was just starting off in the very early days of cinema. Um, <coughs> Conan Doyle died in 1930. He wrote the last Sherlock Holmes story at I can't remember, I think in 1927 or so. Um, <clears throat> and by that time, Holmes was established in the cinema as, as a film character. And I believe that he, there have been more films about Sherlock Holmes than about any other character ever. Um, <clears throat> the, if you look at the picture there in the top left-hand corner, we have one of the great interpreters of Sherlock Holmes, Basil Rathbone. Um, that's probably a still from the 1940s, I think. And Basil Rathbone made lots of Sherlock Holmes films, um, most of them not based on Conan Doyle's original narratives. Um, and then he's just, he's all over the place. I think, if you ask me, Conan Doyle would very much have approved the man on the top right-hand corner, which is Jeremy Brett, um, who played Sherlock Holmes in a series of TV productions for Granada in the 1970s and 80s, 1975 to 85. And to, to those of us who know the stories well, these are really the classic interpretations. Very, very faithful to the stories, beautifully constructed and wonderfully performed. So I think that Corindor would have thought Jeremy Brett was just great. I think he's the best Holmes. Um, as for Robert Downey, I think he would have accepted the check. <laughs> but he might have been a bit puzzled. I mean, this is a version, this is a version of masculinity which makes, which looks very crude next to the masculinity of the, the actual home stories. Cumberbatch, I think he would have been delighted that the scripts in the Cumberbatch Sherlock series, which is now I think in its third season, are extraordinarily witty. And they're very, they're delightfully clever in the way that they adapt elements of the original stories and flip them around, turn them upside down, make jokes of them, parody them, replay them. Uh, it's, it, I think it's just wonderful. Cumberbatch himself, I've never quite understood what women see in him. Um, <laughs> but they seem to see something. <laughs> and. Uh, so he's, he's really become a star on the basis of, of that. Those, of course, are modernizations of the, of the original characters. They still live in Baker Street. The landlady is still Mrs. Hudson. Mycroft is still around the corner. But it's modern London that these people live in. And I think Conan Doyle would have been very happy with that, actually. Um, what I haven't shown there is um, the afterlife of Holmes in, in manga in comics, and on the internet, he's absolutely everywhere. Um, in particular, uh, many people, many internet heads, or whatever they're called, are very excited by the relationship between Holmes and Watson. <laughs> and there is a large semi-pornographic um, literature on the internet in which people write 
stories about homes and what this is called called Sher John. I see you nodding your head there. <coughs> um, so there's a great community of people who who write sort of gay gay home stories. This all started with Star Trek, with Captain Kirk and the guy with the ears. Um, <coughs> so Sherlock Holmes and Watson re have been reinvented as um, a gay couple, and I'm, I think Conan Doyle would have found that a bit puzzling, actually. <laughs> <laughs> so um, following up on um, your chapter on spiritualism, why mm. do you think that Conan Doyle never reinterpreted or adapted Sherlock Holmes to spiritualist beliefs like he did with Professor Challenger? Uh, that, that, that's a very good question. I, I don't know the answer to that. It, there must have been something which told him to leave Holmes out. Um, and and I, I'm sure he was right about that. I mean, Sherlock Holmes, as a spiritualist, would, would just be unacceptable. Um, <coughs> And it's partly because Holmes is very much, he is a materialist, I use that word. Um, <coughs> Holmes, on several occasions, when there appears to be the possibility of the supernatural, always stamps on it. The story of the Sussex vampire uh, is one that some, of, some people may know. When a child has bite marks on its neck and everyone says, oh, it's a vampire. And Holmes will have absolutely none of it, doesn't believe in any of that rubbish. The Hound of the Baskervilles, um, you remember in the Hand of the Baskervilles that Dr. Dr. Hands up. The, the doctor um, comes to him. <coughs> it's a classic re uh, consultant referral beginning that the GP from down in Devon comes to Baker Street to consult the consultant. He says, I've got a problem. I can't deal with it. Please. And he hands the problem over to the great consultant. Um, the doctor whatever his name is, um, says, uh, here's a possible explanation of what happened. So, so not Sir Henry, the other one. The, so somebody basketball died of fright, remember? Um, <clears throat> and here is an old legend. He reads it out about in the 18th century, there was a magical hound on the moors. Um, and you know, maybe this could be the explanation that the hound has come back. We see the, the footprints of an enormous hound there. And Holmes is extremely rude to him. He says, don't talk nonsense. There's no such thing. There has to be a practical material explanation, which, of course, there is. So he, he would be completely spoiled if he lost his materialism. And then the dynamic would, with Watson would go as well. Challenger is, is interesting because, though Challenger is a scientist, he's a thoroughly romantic scientist. He's a real swashbuckling adventure story scientist who hacks his way through the jungle and all this kind of stuff. And I think that the, the romanticism of Challenger perhaps makes him susceptible to, to being put into the spiritualist discourse. And for Conan Doyle, it's, uh, I think he thought of this as, as an important part of the argument. He wanted to show, this is in his novel, The Land of Myth, 1925, he wanted to show that spiritualism was not just for uneducated people. He wanted to show, excuse me, saying this, spiritualism wasn't just for women. You know, it wasn't just for people who didn't know any better. But as a matter of fact, and this was true, of course, there were very respectable, indeed famous scientists, Oliver Lodge might be one, Frederick Myers would be another, who had espoused the spiritualist cause. So he takes Challenger as a kind of piece of argument, and he shows how Challenger, when exposed to the evidence of the spiritual life, comes round and Challenger says, look, I've resisted this as long as I can. I'm skeptical, it's my job, I'm a scientist. Now I have to admit I've seen things which have no explanation according to my philosophy, as it were, and he goes completely over to the other side and becomes a spiritualist. But I think it was a good thing that he left Holmes out of that. <laughs> so any questions from the audience? Otherwise, I'll just keep on asking questions and you don't want that. So, yes. Hey, um, I was thinking hey. about the kind of reactions that came when uh, he killed off Holmes for the first time. Mm. 
Um, and I was thinking, uh, like, you know, that letter from the Queen that he got, which was very suggestive. Um, and I was thinking, like, how many people would be upset in the same way if he turned Holmes into a spiritualist? <laughs> um, I was wondering if you if you have any comments about like the the reactions that happen, like the huge like you know amounts of things and like the death threats and things like that. You know, do you do you have more to add to that? Um, yes, a lot of that is legend, actually. Um, the letter from the Queen. Um, <clears throat> there's a legend that when Sherlock Holmes was apparently killed at the Reichenbach Falls, all the clerks in the city of London went into mourning and wore, wore, wore black ties for a week. It, it, it isn't actually true, but it's very good publicity. Um, <clears throat> but I think it, to, and to take your question seriously, there is a way in which we develop a sense of ownership of cultural artifacts. Um, and we feel personally upset if something happens to them that, that we didn't anticipate or don't like. So it is true that when, after only a very few years, he decided he had enough of Sherlock Holmes. It's not true that Conan Doyle hated Sherlock Holmes, but he, he wanted to get on with other things. And he, didn't, he foresaw correctly that his reputation would be that of the creator of Sherlock Holmes. He didn't want that to happen. So he thinks, OK, enough is enough. Um, <coughs> he, he writes the last story as he believes and Sherlock Holmes goes over the waterfall. There was a big reaction, <coughs> particularly um, among the readers of the Strand magazine, because the Strand magazine was the, the medium through which most of the Holmes short stories were disseminated. There was a big drop in sales. Um, many people did write in. I don't think Queen Victoria was one of them. But many people did write in and say, you can't do this to us. Almost as if he'd, he'd done something that was an affront to people personally. Um, <coughs> and he held out for a few years. But I mean, it's interesting that uh, I, mean, I wouldn't say it wasn't really such a big deal for him. So later on when he was uh, actually on the golf course talking to this guy called um, Fletcher Robinson, um, <coughs> this fellow said, hey, I've got a really good idea for a home story. Why don't you set it on Dartmoor? and um, we'll have an enormous hound. Oh, OK, let's do it. So he brings him back. He brings Sherlock Holmes back initially in a story which is supposed to have taken place before Reichenbach Falls. OK, so he's not resurrecting him. He's just simply doing a prequel. But then after a while, why not? And the Strand magazine is offering him huge amounts of money. And the, the sort of world rights for Sherlock Holmes are not something that you would want to, to turn down. So <coughs> he very ingeniously writes The Empty House, which is an explanation that Holmes didn't die after all, and continued with the, the Holmes stories for a couple more decades. Um, <coughs> there seems to be something, and in, in the end, I think it's mysterious. In the end, I, I, I don't think that I can account for it. There's something in the form, in the chemical formula of Sherlock Holmes that makes him matter to people. It could be in that, you know, people who watch Cumberbatch, many of them never heard of Conan Doyle, I should think. Um, but the character is there. There's something compelling about the character. And look, this is what writers can do. It's what they can do, and it's a great gift. The reason, um, is this on? Mm -hmm. Can you hear me? Yeah. Um, if the reason we find him so compelling is because he's so flawed. <laughs> he's got no social skills. He's a drug addict. He's got one close friend. He has a hopeless, non-existent romantic life. And the only woman he ever fell in love with was the woman who outwitted him, right? Irene Adler. And, and I mean, that's, because he's not perfect. And, and Yes, he's brilliant, and yes, he's brave and strong and the good guy, but really, I mean, he's <laughs> not a happy camper. <laughs> and, um, and, <coughs> and I think that's appealing, you know, mm. that, he's not, that he's not perfect and that he has problems um, and that he doesn't fit in. 
Yes. I think that's really appealing to yes. a lot of people. Yeah. And, um, and the other thing I wonder about too, this, I mean, it's just an observation. The repeatedly in the Sherlock Holmes stories and in Sir Nigel and the White Company, he writes about strong women or he describes yes. women as being strong yes. and of having uh, special skills or empathies or sympathies that men don't have. Yep. And wow, all of a sudden, bang, that last decade, his son dies. Yeah. He's in a, in a very depressed place. He thinks, like a lot of us do as we get older, the world's going to hell in a handbasket. And who does he start believing and sympathizing and empathizing with? His second wife, the little girls in Coddington, I mean, it's, he, it's almost as if he's kind of moving away from that masculine-oriented world that <coughs> he inhabited for so long through the army and his profession and, you know, the, the science end of things. Just a thought. Um, thank you. I completely agree with you in, in your last point. I, I think that that last decade where he feminizes his work and his life is a kind of reparation. And this is a man who's lived very much in a man's world. Uh, not just the sport, uh, but the, the profession of writing, for example. It was all men, all his friends were men. Um, <coughs> trying the ridiculous attempts to join the army and all that kind of stuff. It's been very much masculinity. I think towards the end, there is an adjustment. I think you're quite right about that, and it's an important one. Um, <coughs> as for Holmes' flaws, you're right about that too. I want to protest, however, Holmes is not a drug addict. He is a recreational drug user. <laughs> um, because addicts are people who can't stop. But whenever he gets work, he stops. Yeah, but he... <laughs> Why should he stay stuck? Because he, uh, he can give up any time. This is what that is say. Anyway, so <coughs> the, the business about the, the, the flaws is quite right. He's a, he's a superman in some respects. He's a fantastic brain. He can solve problems nobody else can, can do. But you're right. He's almost autistic in his um, relations with other people. Watson is his only friend. Um, and he's not interested in having other friends. It's not as if he wants them and can't get them. Um, his manners are atrocious. You wouldn't like to live with him. You know, he fires the revolver into the wall and he's got his, his chemistry set spread out on the dining table and all that kind of thing. Not much fun to live with. I should say that that pattern of the skillful investigator whose domestic life is a train wreck has become almost obligatory for later crime fiction, right? You think again and again of these police shows on the TV, they're out solving the crime, they go home, it's, I want a divorce, you know, or, or they're alcoholic or, or something. There, there seems to be a compensatory mechanism there. Um, you said so many things, there's something else I wanted to respond to, I can't remember what it was now. But yes, the, the, the thing about the flaws, that's the, the function of character that, that, that is particularly enjoyable. And we would hate it if he had a, an, an unblemished domestic life, wife and two kids, you know, mortgage. No. Yes, sorry. Uh, thank you, Professor, for a very uh, rational analysis of the uh, uh, doll, Mr. Doll. Uh, I wonder whether you have anything to comment on this um, writing style and uh, artistic style uh, as compared to the other British uh, Greeks, you know, great uh, writers and novelists. Thank you. Um, yes, I do. I, I have spent most of my professional life <laughs> dealing with, with people who have a higher reputation in, in the literary world. Virginia Woolf, Joseph Conrad, um, there's a kind of split uh, in the way that we think about writing between popular writers and serious writers. And to me, this is actually a, a misconceived way of looking at the, at the landscape. Um, 
even 10 years ago, you would agree, we wouldn't have had Conan Doyle on our syllabus because he's not quite respectable as a literary stylist. I think that he's a very accomplished literary stylist. Um, he is one of the most gifted writers of narrative, of stories, ever. Um, <clears throat> and his style is its very functional. It's very undecorated. It's very fast. Um, <clears throat> he uses dialogue well. He can describe things journalistically in a, just in a, a few touches. All of these, I think, are great skills. But they make him, and, and these are reasons why everyone loves to read him. I think another reason why people like to read him is the stories are short, you know. Um, <clears throat> but this makes him different from a stylist like D.H. Lawrence, for example, to think of a contemporary. Um, Henry James, another contemporary. The, these are great writers of a different kind. Um, <clears throat> And I would say that they, Henry James, Lawrence, and so on, are in the end more intellectually satisfying than Conan Doyle. Um, you can go back to their work again and again and find new things in it. Um, <clears throat> but I don't accept this distinction between serious and non-serious fiction, because Conan Doyle was just as serious, took his writing as seriously, worked on it just as hard um, as... Joyce or, or Wolf or anybody else. So I think he's a very gifted writer, very gifted. And he's been a model to a lot of people who come after. There are more people trying to write like Conan Doyle than people trying to write like James Joyce, for example. <laughs> <coughs> um, he had done a lot of journalism. I think that's quite important to the kind of writing that he does in his fiction. He was a professional writer. He lived by his pen. Um, he had to please people in order to make a living. And so the style which he evolves comes out of that, a close relationship with his readers. We'll take one more, qu we'll take one more question and then uh, we're going to have to wrap it up. Sure. Uh, would you like to make some comments about why, why did uh, Conan Doe choose uh, 221B, Baker Street, as his office or home address. And secondly, how would you comment about uh, the influence of uh, those uh, writing on the writings of Agatha Christie? Oh, okay. Um, <clears throat> I think he put him in Baker Street because Baker Street is right in the middle. Right in the middle. And there are moments in which he describes Sherlock Holmes as being sitting in the middle of a web which extends all the way across London. And he's, he's sort of, it's, it's this sort of George Eliot image, actually. He's registering all the vibration on, on the web right about. 221B, because it doesn't exist, I think. I mean, it could very, could very well have been 223B or, or 224F. I don't know. It's a fictional address. Um, <coughs> uh, it, he is, of course, the godfather of modern crime writing. You mentioned Agatha Christie, but we could, I mean, any other modern crime writer anywhere, not just, of course, in, in England, but in, in, in America, in Scandinavia now, all over the world, he's, he's the paradigm. He sets it up. And in some ways, Agatha Christie's uh, puzzles are, are really variations on, on Conan Doyle's. So she learned an enormous amount from him, and she develops her own particular world, which is, which is different. But I don't think we would have had, I'm sure we would not have had Agatha Christie if we had not had Sherlock Holmes. Okay, thank you. Um, if I can now re-invite uh, university librarian Peter Sidorko to come <coughs> back and say a few words. No? Okay, all right. <laughs> you, don't, you don't have to. All I have to say is uh, thank you to Douglas and to Evelyn. Um, I think it's probably been one of the most fascinating book talks that <coughs> I've had the pleasure to uh, witness. So please uh, join me in thanking you <coughs> both. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs>
<coughs> Fantastic. We get to open them here. <laughs> Thanks. <coughs> Thank you very much. <clears throat>